I really don't have much fun. Good evening, everybody. And welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to tonight's performance of the college. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. We first have our speaker who will speak. Then we will have our question and answer period. Then we will have our official rebuttal period. We have a speaker tonight. All right. Joseph W. Kopsik. This speaker states that I will analyze the ideas of John Locke, Thomas Paine, Pierre Joseph Proudhorn, Henry George, Samuel E. Conkin III, Gary Charter, Kevin Carson, and others on how these thinkers have proposed taking centrist or moderate approaches towards solving economic problems which divided conservative leaning libertarians from the radical left. The focus will be on issues related to landed property, markets, organized labor, and financial freedom and social contract theory. Joe will also touch on the similarities and differences which libertarians have with the Greens, socialists, and anarchists, and outline potential political strategies which their agreements suggest may be a practical way to achieve multi-partisan political change. Let's welcome, with a rousing round of applause, Joseph W. Kopsik. Thank you very much to Charles, Tim, and the College of Complexes for hosting me. My name is Joe Kopsik, and my talk today is called Left-Wing Market Anarchism at the Crossroads of Libertarian and Anarchist Thought. I'm going to talk about the political and economic philosophy of the left wing of the libertarian movement and explain the differences and similarities between libertarianism and anarchism. Just keep, keep talking. To be clear, I won't be talking about the libertarian left, that is the most left-wing schools of radical and anarchist thought, such as libertarian socialism, anarcho-communism, anarcho-syndicalism, social anarchism. These tendencies are not pro-market, but staunchly anti-market. They believe markets are not necessary in favor of collective direct action, direct democracy, and participatory planning as methods of managing and allocating resources. These ideas fall under the category of market abolitionism, also called anagorism, referring to, the, to a lack of open markets. Per recon and part polity are also relevant terms here, referring to participatory economics and politics. Although these schools of anarchist thought are both left-wing and anarchist, they do not qualify as left-wing market anarchists, since they wholly reject the need for trade, exchange, and markets. They are much more difficult to describe as compatible with libertarians than those strains of anarchism which consider themselves pro-market but anti-capitalism. I won't be talking much either about right-wing variants of libertarian thought either. These are the staunchly pro-market, pro-capitalist, pro-private property, and quote-unquote anarcho-capitalists. People who believe an anarchism and capitalism are compatible and that capitalism can survive without a state. Since that simple admission would be enough to get them left out of a room of anarchists, I won't be talking about them as if they understand freedom better than everyone else does. Instead, I'm going to be focusing on the libertarian and anarchist center. We might call this the radical center of the political spectrum, although the term has a somewhat different meaning when talking about American politics, which I'll explain uh, in discussing radical centrism as a path to political compromise. Um, I also won't exactly be talking about the Libertarian Party platform, although there may seem to be a great deal of overlap between these ideologies. But I'd like to get something out of the way and explain what libertarians want done with the federal government in case anyone isn't clear on that. First of all, Rick Perry and, uh, and Ted Cruz tried to plagiarize Ron Paul's list of five federal departments to cut. The original list did not include Finally. the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and only consisted of departments of Commerce, Energy, Education, Housing, Urban Development, and Interior. Ron Paul hasn't been involved with the party in a while, but most LPO members will agree with that. Commerce and Energy are repositories for lobbying and corporate welfare. Education is indoctrinating our youth, and Housing and Interior are rigging the markets for land with government interference and speculation. We want to reduce the federal government to its originally intended core functions, defense, courts, and treasury, and let the states run the medical and retirement entitlements, yeah, Medicare, fine. Medicaid, and Social Security, let the states run them more or less the way they please, because the enumerated powers of the Constitution say nothing about either health or retirement. Also because the fact that we do have federal employees who have pensions doesn't automatically mean we should, especially not forever, or that they're financially sustainable at current levels, or that state and local governments could employ these people instead doesn't mean that individual pensioners couldn't make their own decisions about health and retirement. We want to cut the cabinet in half to its original size, um, or slightly larger maybe, 
bring the, bring the troops home, dismantle hundreds of overseas military bases, reclaim our fiscal and political sovereignty for international organizations, and that's just what we want to do in the short term. But like I said, I won't be focusing on libertarian public policy tonight so much as on libertarian political theory. What I'll be focusing on are the schools of radical libertarian and anarchist thought, which we can find on the political spectrum, somewhere between those left-wing tendencies of anarchism, which originated in late 19th century Europe, the so-called traditional or classical strains of anarchism, and the modern strain of American libertarianism, which is perceived uh, by much of the public as right of center or even far right. This perception primarily results from libertarian critiques of Republicans as not supporting free markets enough, not supporting balanced budgets, entrepreneurship, <laughs> values popularly perceived as associated with capitalism, conservative economics, and the right. A little bit about me, why I'm here. Um, sorry if I'm moving too quickly, using a lot of terms people aren't familiar with. Uh, throughout the presentation, I'll define and differentiate key terms, uh, explain the differences between different schools of thought, uh, clarify the differences in the manners in which anarchists at the left, right, and center think and talk about several key issues in political economy. Most importantly, the political social contract and the three classical factors of production, land, labor, and capital. Uh, I'd like to share a bit about myself. I grew up in Lake Bluff and Lake Forest, northern suburbs of Chicago. 2009, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin Madison, receiving a BA in majoring, majoring in political science. Yeah. While in college, I learned to write essays on constitutional law, international relations, political philosophy, and theory. In 2010, I started the Aquarian Agrarian blog, posted my college papers, began writing new original essays on libertarian public policy, political party factions, and independent political parties, uh, and radical and anarchist political theory. Last year, through the book Patch.com, I published my first two collections of essays. I have a book here which is available too. Uh, in addition to my books and blog, I've created and moderated many groups on Facebook to facilitate the discussion of, uh, of approaches to solving political, economic, and social problems which are radical and anarchist in nature. Among these, basic income and tax reform, which explores the best manners of simplifying and reforming the tax code without neglecting those who depend on financial support from the government. And a group I originally named Market Anarchism Without Adjectives, which focuses on uniting radicals and anarchists of all stripes. Between 2012 and 2016, I ran for the U.S. House of Representatives three times from Wisconsin, Illinois, and Oregon, each time as a right and independent. I'm active on YouTube with Joe Cops and Paul Congress, uh, and I currently serve as the marketing director of the Libertarian Party of Chicago, and then uh, attend LP meetings in my home chapter in Lake County. I also belong to the Chicago chapter of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies, and I attend meetings of the Lake County Green Party, although I'm not a member. You might be thinking, why would a libertarian want to have anything to do with the Green Party or a group of socialists? Aren't libertarians against unions? Don't libertarians value property rights more than they care about a clean environment? The answer to the last two questions is, of course, no. Libertarians don't hate the environment. We might want to abolish the EPA, at least some of us, but only to stop it from being used for evil. We've learned that a person has a more direct incentive to keep his property free of pollutants if he actually owns his property than if he doesn't or someone else does. There's no reason why polluting shouldn't be considered aggression against the air, water, groundwater, and land rights of everyone it affects. There's no reason why the polluter wouldn't or shouldn't be held responsible for that in a voluntary society and made to provide restitution to his victims. So, we can solve environmental problems with property rights. On the topic of unions, libertarians strongly criticize public employees' unions because they sometimes see ta use taxpayer funds to lobby for their own continued employment. So libertarians see it, they lobby for the large and growth of the government, to lobby for the state to continue to exist. But when it comes to private sector unions, libertarians only oppose those union activities which are compulsory, and they object to union elections in which the majority of workers impose their will on the minority and the rest of the workplace. Uh, surprisingly, the IWW, a radical industrial union founded right here in Chicago in 1905, agrees with the libertarians on both counts. The IWW and the libertarians share their fierce criticism of the National Labor Relations Act in 1933, the Wagner Act, and their skepticism as to whether the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, which the Wagner Act created, is effective. And they even agree uh, as to whether, they even wonder whether it should continue to exist. These are unionists who, uh, yes. Uh, libertarians also agree with the IWW that it was unwise uh, to politicize labor issues by surrendering decision-making authority to bureaucrats and the Department of Labor. Additionally, although libertarians are skeptical of both unions and socialism, the IWW at least recognize and admit that the unions and the social safety net are not features of socialism, but instead features of capitalism, which are meant as concessions designed to avoid full socialism. Brief side note, the facts that welfare programs are features of capitalism ought to help show that anarcho-capitalists and followers of Ludwig von Mies are wrong when they assume that Nazis were socialists simply because they had a social safety net. 
and use the word socialist, which is solely for propaganda purposes, to try to mitigate their evil. Um, the Nazi social safety net was exclusively for Germans, uh, about four-fifths of the people in the country at the time, and it excluded a bit of society from those benefits. Since Hitler ruled nearly 100 years after Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, he ruled during a time when the dominant form of socialism in the world was Marxian socialism, which originated in Germany, and proclaimed workers of the world unite, not achieve the goals of society by killing one-fifth of society. I have an article called Top Six Reasons Why Nazis Weren't Socialist on my blog, and I'd like more details on that. But back to unions. Libertarians who believe the right to work laws inhibit the freedom of contracts will find themselves in good company with radical industrial unions in discussing the various union processes and procedures which the Wagner Act established and standardized, namely union voting by majority rule and the compulsory representation of workers by the one union awarded the exclusive contract and negotiate on their behalf. Libertarians believe that this policy confers a legal privilege upon the union, insulating it from fair and honest competition with unions that wish to grow their membership and represent workers in the same workplace or bargaining unit. Additionally, although the IWW makes it clear that it is non-political, the IWW, Libertarian, and Green parties all refuse to make uh, refuse to make it clear and official whether they are anarchists or statists. As strange as it might sound, labor and the environment could just be the key issues that unite libertarians and socialists and greens instead of continuing to divide them. Uh, that is, as long as we approach these differences, seeking to understand uh, and analyze rather than judge. Also, uh, by, as, uh, as Aristotle said, <clears throat> entertaining an idea without adopting it. That is, knowing we can appreciate one detail of a philosophy or system without necessarily endorsing everything bad that's ever been done by someone who identified with that political label. Uh, this is an important key to preventing the kind of absolutist, you're either with us or, or against us, thinking and rhetoric that have increasingly dominated American global politics since 9-11 and the start of the global war on terror. Is there any reason why libertarians and greens and radicals of all varieties shouldn't work together? It, it is true, as long as they have a common enemy. After all, the Nazis burned books written by classical liberals, anarchists, communists, and socialists alike. And so it took a combined effort of followers of all those ideologies to face down that threat together. Now that the ideology of hate is again on the rise, it should be clearly obvious to all that it will take the same coalition to defeat it again, hopefully this time once and for all. Radical centrism. In 2010, Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina said in an interview he feared the unholy alliance between the right and the left, which was growing against Barack Obama's military policy, really the, the, you know, the government's military policy, which he supports. Uh, this came several years after pundits noted a rise of a progressive libertarian alliance comprised of Ron Paul, Dennis Kucinich, Bernie Sanders, and others with support in the wings from Ralph Nader's out of politics. Well, it's always been out of politics. In truth, the Green and the Progressives have plenty in common with the modern libertarians and the old right paleo-conservatives and paleo-libertarians which influence them, especially when it comes to issues like government transparency, balanced budget, and sound money, and civil liberties, and social freedoms, and to a limited extent, foreign policy, sound money, and decentralization. Having noticed a long time ago that this alliance was taking shape, I sympathized for over 10 years with both the progressives and radical leftists who hate the big budgets and more longer than the neoliberal the Democrats and the Republicans and the libertarians and conservatives who are skeptical of military intervention whose voices are drowned out by the crony capitalists and neocons and the Republican establishment. The left and right wing of the American imperialist war hawk, the neoliberal and neoconservative synthesis, which controls the federal government, support very many of the same bloated budgets, military adventurism, economically illiterate, illiterate tax and spending policies, and uh, interference with the right to self-defense. Additionally, both party establishments support requiring people to beg the government for the permission to use their own property and obligating them to beg permission and pay expensive fees to the government for the privilege of being issued whatever licenses and permits may be deemed necessary to engage in any and all type of activity imaginable. Ordinary, voluntary, harmless, everyday human activities which are none of their business. It also includes things that we're told we must do in order to use our own property and uh, pay taxes on our own property. Um, I challenge you to argue uh, that either major party does one of these things, uh, does all these things more than the other. They're just as bad as each other. If we want to learn about alternative social and political paradigms and economic, uh, the alternative systems of exchange, if we want to have more choices when it comes to who and what we vote for, what we buy and how we live, the first thing we have to do is stop debating whether Republicans or Democrats are lesser of two evils, stop debating whether Nazis or Stalinists were less evil, as if they have any real differences, as if they don't have long histories of colluding with each other. It's one thing to know which side you'll be on if you're forced to choose between two evils, but choosing the lesser of two evils always results in evil, which, by the way, evil is never necessary regardless of the good things that defenders of evil claim results from it. 
pick a side of you and insist, but it's your responsibility to refuse to examine what your alternatives are and whether it's possible and strategically beneficial to work for others to make those alternatives more viable and more likely to be put into practice in the real world. Whether we're talking about underdog political candidates filing to run for office, novelty goods hitting market shelves, experimental building techniques, new developments in science and technology, we need more choices, we need better choices, and we need them now. A uh, left-wing market anarchist is someone who recognizes that we can't simply be, we simply can't be free, have a free society, a free democracy, or a free market, as long as representatives of labor or capital collude with the government to use threats, intimidation, coercion, and force in order to establish a monopoly or oligopoly, giving undue favors to particular industries, markets, and modes of economic organization, using the brute strength of the state to help unpopular choices remain viable modes of operation. These oligarchs in government, business, and organized labor collude to amend the law in a way that allows them to legally eliminate alternatives to those products and technologies and to themselves, which the government can be convinced to endorse and legitimize. The unfounded grant of legal legitimacy to an enterprise results in the twin evils of regulatory capture and moral hazard. We are led to believe that a product or service is trustworthy just because the government says it is. So we are less cautious and wary about our decisions and more government, more gullible to what the government tells us. Oligarchs also undertake efforts to eliminate alternative candidates running against the members of the power elite which they have selected to pretend to represent the people. This is how we lose our third, fourth, fifth choices and so on without cause and reduces things to a binary choice. I find that political disagreements are all too often cast in terms of black and white, life or death, all or nothing, my way or the highway, binary opposition and ultimatums. Persistence of false dichotomies is a tragedy because this type of thing discourages and even threatens the peaceful communication of new ideas which borrow from both sides, thus make reconciliation and compromise possible. They make it impossible though. Black and white thinking encourages absolutist thinking. After the enemy has been concocted or scapegoated and then defeated, the absolutist attitude which has prevailed helps empower the rise of single-minded controls, monarchy in its many different shapes, monopolistic forms of association, and unquestionable monolithic, monolithic authority. <laughs> Additionally, universalist or assimilationist sentiments which pressure people to abandon cultural values not shared by those in control and eventually the elimination of choice altogether in all spheres of human action. Absolutist thinking creates a free speech chilling effect, a speech that can result in peace and compromise. Speech which many of us fear because it often causes us to challenge what we've been taught, what we assume, suppose, and imagine what okay. hasn't been taught, okay. and challenge us, and, and, and thus challenge how we perceive them. Essentially, to entertain the possibility that our cognition and our analytical skills are flawed, which can be scary. Most important, it can threaten the ability of the power structure to get away with misleading and lying to us. Absolutism isn't just a way of thinking about the world, it's a style of governance, one which ought to be re rejected by anarchists and libertarians alike for obvious reasons. It's because of this need for reconciliation, the need to create a unified front of freedom-loving people against tyrants that them must be to you tonight about how pre-20th century thinkers like Locke, Paine, Proudhon, and George, as well as several notable American libertarian thinkers in the last 50 years, have embraced modern and centrist approaches to solving political and economic problems and disagreements. These these uh, systems and tactics are not only abundant and varied, many of them have real-world applications, are workable, have been tried, and even successful. In my opinion, the more we know about how, no, how noteworthy and well-respected political and economic theorists have suggested resolving these disagreements, the faster we'll realize just how many of the common distinctions we make between the so-called left and right are nothing more than parlor tricks designed to keep us arguing amongst ourselves instead of figuring out who we agree our oppressors are, confronting them together, and bickering about our differences after the main threats to our freedom have been eliminated and neutralized. My hope is that by spreading awareness about alternative social and economic institutions which avoid, evade, or subvert the state, we may make it much easier for ourselves and others to imagine and work towards a society in which no government may forcibly interfere in nor direct anyone's social interactions or economic transactions unless they are a threat to others and adjust the acquired property. I also hope that understanding what the, what the anarchists left and right or right have in common will help make it easier for us to imagine a centrist economic position or system. Additionally, easier to imagine how to popularize and promote such a system in order to use peaceful, respectful discussion and rhetoric to convince people to adopt it of their own free will without resorting to using government as tools to force, as a tool to force and threaten others in agreement through begrudging assent, which is not consent, but submission. I'm a firm believer in the right to criticize the government, the right to communicate that criticism, the right to live under a form of government you support, the responsibility of government to earn the trust and the wealth of people it claims to represent and protect. After having been a Democrat at 12, a Green Party supporter, and a teenager, 
Uh, Mark says at 19, libertarian at 22, and a student of anarchist political philosophy since 2009. I'm also a strong believer in the right to change one's mind. I've always been interested in learning about alternative viewpoints which challenge my own, finding common ground between them, and most importantly, fully understanding them before I judge them. I believe it's very important to comprehend an ideology before you condemn it. Even if uh, only for the simple fact that if you see everything in absolutes, you might end up excusing or endorsing violence against yourself in the event you someday decide to change your mind the slightest bit. And there's very little that could change the public mind about anarchists more than successfully communicating that we're not all, that we are all calm, organized, respectful, polite people who are dedicated to peace, and that above all, we're interested, more interested in discussing ideas, teaching classes, and holding books instead of bombs. Next, I'd like to examine the etymology of the words radical and anarchist, so those unfamiliar with radical political theory can understand what I mean when I use these words, and also better understand what concerns motivate anarchists and libertarians alike, namely defending people who are being oppressed and bossed around, and people who just want to oppress, excuse, people who just want to address problems directly to solve them as soon as possible. First off, radical. Radical is an anarchist are not all violent, and they're not necessarily people who throw Molotov cocktails and destroy property, because they've been frequently depicted, especially since the 94 riots against the WTO in Seattle. The root of the word radical is radix, which means root. A radical is simply and literally someone who seeks to get to the root of a problem. Radical and extremists are not necessarily the same thing. Next, anarchist. This is a word whose root is archon. Um, someone is someone who wants to live without an archon. Uh, so an anarchist is someone who wants to live without an archon. The meaning, of, the meaning of archon is debatable, but it is perhaps best rendered in English as ruler, leader, or dictator. In her book, The Human Condition, the philosopher Hannah Arendt essentially argues that the word carries a connotation of a person who comes first. This connotation would imply that anarchism is not an absence of rules, nor even necessarily an absence of rulers, but instead anarchism is defined by the absence of a single person who say it always goes. This could be construed to include any dictator, tyrant, or monarch, any person who rules but refuses to share the privilege of rulemaking with other people, who refuses to share power. However, this definition of anarchism is probably not what you'll hear if you ask an anarchist of the left or the right. Um, however, they would define the word. Um, they would probably say the definition I gave is close but incomplete. An anarchist of the left would say nobody should have absolute authority, but anarchism also involves ending the exploitation of the environment and exploitation of working people, such that bosses, entrepreneurs, and property owners are not free to use their property in a way that allows them to behave like dictators, profiting from their disuse and abuse of their own property, or other goods. Others go without those things altogether. An anarchist of the right, on the other hand, is to say generally a libertarian, but add that anarchism involves ending the state ending any state, ending the legitimate initiation of violence, which it entails, by ending its monopoly on moral authority and the permitted use of physical power. Uh, by, by this I mean not only can the state visit force upon us, it can also le legally prohibit and limit us from defending ourselves, especially against them. I'll explain that a bit later. Depending on which libertarian you ask, ending the state might also mean an end of government itself or an end of coercion. However, not all libertarians agree about whether governments and states are necessarily the same thing. They don't all agree about whether social ostracism is coercive or intimidating, whether the fact that it does not involve direct or overt force makes it an acceptable and non-coercive mode of social interaction. Those disagreements aside, all anarchists agree that ending the state, ending the monopoly on legitimate use of violence means an end to the legitimization of aggression by a monolithic public institution. But this does not guarantee an end to aggression committed by agencies lacking state protection, however. And that's where the anarchists of the left come from. The ones who criticize anarcho-capitalists who seem to hate the state only because of stopping them from setting up their own private, personal mini-state on a property which they conquer, homestead through some means, legally purchase from the government that they hate. We don't know. Presumably they want to avoid legitimizing and empowering the government by asking them permission, right? Well, you've got to ask them, how do you plan to get this land? Um, what they plan on doing justify, we have to ask them what they plan on doing justify uh, to others that they've earned the right to keep it. And this is a frequent subject of debate between left and right anarchists, and it's one I'll explain in greater depth when I get to the land issue. Suffice it to say, for now, the struggle to get anarchists to agree on which, what it should take to earn the acquisition and ownership of land and property is perhaps the single most important obstacle uniting anarchists wishing to test out and live under a diverse range of economic systems and styles of exchange. To answer a few key questions about anarchism and libertarianism and also federalism, Few questions that would help, be helpful to answer right away before diving into our main topic. 
what key did, what are the key differences between left and right wing radical thought? Who are the first people to call themselves anarchists and libertarians? How the how have the meanings of these words changed over time as the left and right have fought over them? First off, the differences between anarchists left and right. The key differences between the left wing anarchism and the American form of radical libertarianism, which has arisen over the last 50 years, is that the so called libertarian right is more radically individualist, more enthusiastically pro market, and more cautious about whether and how to abolish the state than the forms of libertarian anarchism which came before. The libertarian right is cautious about abolishing the state too quickly because it wants to leave everything to the free market except for basic services like the military, perhaps veterans, law enforcement, border patrol, of course of justice, which supposedly nobody but the state can provide. That is, provide using our wealth and the ability to work of their own. Left-leaning libertarians consider very few of these services easy to justify, if not undesirable altogether, especially in the case of borders. So they're more likely to say that the most basic agencies of government are things like public administration, justice, the court system, infrastructure, supplemental nutritional assistance, uh, perhaps services pertaining to health, labor, and education. And so the libertarian line of thinking goes, if those are the most essential services government provides, then they should be the last functions of government which should be abolished before we can have nearly irrefutable proof that we can enter into a voluntary state of society without risking unnecessary turmoil, dispossession, and bloodshed. Tendencies within the libertarian right include the self-described anarcho-capitalists, pragmatic political libertarians who join the libertarian party and consider themselves anarchists, favoring the human government, and those libertarians who consider anarchism possible but don't consider it immoral to participate in the political process, one of them. Second, the origin of the terms anarchist and libertarian. Some say the first person to describe himself as a libertarian was Joseph de Jacques, a writer and poet associated with the Paris Commune, who used the term in 1857 while criticizing fellow anarchist Proudhon. Uh, nowadays, de Jacques is described as an anarcho-communist, but he also advocated natural exchange, and thus could be considered a supporter of markets. But de Jacques was not the first self-described libertarian. Nearly 80 years earlier, in 1789, uh, as Justin told you during his presentation, writer and historian William Belsham, an English Whig, who supported progressive political reform, used the term libertarian to defending free will against what he called the necessitarian thinking, but what we now call the determinist philosophy. He was in predestination and preordination rather than free will. Of course, that's philosophical libertarianism, not this? political libertarianism, but they're not unrelated. The first person to call him an anarchist, at least we know of in modern times, is Pierre Joseph Proudhon, a French philosopher, self described as a federalist. He, just, he is known today as the founder of the economic philosophy known as mutualism and even as the father of anarchism. The school of anarchist thought, which he founded, is referred to as mutualist anarchism and sometimes described occasionally as an insult, market socialism. Proudhon favored collective management of resources combined with market based allocation and a national public bank. Third and last, how these terms change their uh, meaning and association. For those who are wondering, how can you be a federalist and an anarchist at the same time? 200 years ago, federalist didn't mean someone who supports a strong central nationalist government. Uh, back then, it referred to a system where power is shared between the central government and the regional or local units of government, with each having independence over duly delegated, distinct, separate spheres of policy influence to prevent interference. Sounds like the original ten of the American model, right? Well, back then, federalism was practiced as much more compatible with uh, localism, subsidiarity, and decentralization. In the American system, dual federalism refers to separation of powers between central government and states, while triple federalism refers to adding units of government below the state level, really within, because they're not subverted to them, to have some independence too. Anarchism and federalism are perfectly compatible. If you consider that in America, people in the states created the federal government. The federal government didn't create the people or create the states. And if the, federal, if the people created the federal government, this should only exist at the mercy of the people. And submit to abolition or dissolution if that is the people's will, especially if it's more oppressive than more local jurisdictions. For the same reason we fought the revolution, that each crime should be tried close to where they occurred. We shouldn't be governed by dissident authorities. In the late 19th century, anarchist, socialists, and communists, that is, left-wing anarchists, referred to themselves as libertarians without shame. Some say the term libertarian started becoming interchangeable with anarchism when in the early 20th century, the public reputation of anarchism as violent became more persistent. Sacco and Benzetti, for example, and it became riskier to print the word anarchist in newspapers, and so libertarian supposedly became a sort of euphemism for anarchism. The early 1970s saw some of the first sparks of modern American libertarian movement 
publication of several influential books by Murray Rothbard, including Power and Market and Poor and New Liberty, founding the U.S. Libertarian Party in 1971, and the first electoral vote ever recorded for a Libertarian presidential candidate, and for an openly gay man for president, and for a woman for vice president, John Hosper, since 28th in 1972. Murray Rothbard was an economist and prolific author, influenced by, just to say that is not a real Murray Rothbard quote, influenced by Australian, Austrian economists such as Karl Menger, Eugen von von Baburg, uh, Ludwig von Mises, and Friedrich Hayek. And although described as the founder of anarcho-capitalism, Rothbard wrote in the mid-1950s under the pseudonym, pseudonym Aubrey Herbert that we, referring to libertarians, are not anarchists adding that those who say libertarians are anarchists are being unhistorical and etymologically unclear, and that non-archist perhaps fits better as a descriptor for libertarians than either anarchist, or in Rothbard's own words, archist, basically authoritarianism or tyranny. Some libertarians and anarchists, especially those who lean to the left, feel that Rothbard intentionally hijacked the term libertarian from the left and reframed libertarianism as a struggle for freedom and independence from the state and planned economies rather than a struggle for autonomy and liberation from all forms of oppression and hierarchy, whether it's oppression by governmental actors or non-governmental ones. In 2007, the Mises Institute published some of Rothbard's unpublished late 1970s writings as the betrayal of the American right, the content of which solidifies in many minds Rothbard's reputation for historical revisionism and Confederate and German apologetics, which often led the, not, the, the, me, led the Jewish Rothbard to def defend and align himself with the admitted racists and anti-Semites of the old right. In fact, one of his main influences, Ludwig von Mises, was an Austrian Jew who fled Austria in 1934, settling in the United States in 1940, evades some anarcho capitalists. He once served as economic advisor to Otto von Habsburg and before that to Austrian Chancellor Engelbert Dolfus. The fact that Dolfus, although an Austro fascist in name, opposed the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria by Germany, and was later assassinated by Nazis, unfortunately escapes the notice of not only critics, but also many adherents of libertarianism. That this factoid is so little known should do wonders to help reveal the irony of those Mises support, uh, followers farthest to the right who favor strict immigration and border controls and see their idol Mises working for a monarch and a fascist because it seems that a few of them have decided to call themselves anarcho-monarchists and anarcho-fascists in their vain attempts to rationalize and excuse their total ignorance of the Mises and the politics of interwar Austria. It's these ignorant right-wing apologetics and admittedly the somewhat intelligent yet vitriolic critiques of democracy and collectivism, usually as status, coercive, anti-market, and anti-individual, which have alienated the right-wing libertarians from the left-wingers. These apologetics come from not only Rothbard and his anti-interventionists, <coughs> but often racist allies in the old right, as well as some students of Mies, and also followers of German-American paleo-libertarian econ economist Hans Hermann Hoppe also those Ayn Rand followers who may be unaware of her admitted disdain for libertarians and anarchists, and some self-described libertarians who might more accurately be termed alt-right all right and faking libertarianism. But, of course, most of those who identify as anarchists take Rothbard's advice and consider it ridiculous that members of such groups are truly anarchists. Aside from fighting over who gets to use the terms of libertarian and anarchist, liberal is also a term of contention between the modern liberals and the classical liberals. Each supports liberty and government, but over the last 50 years, modern liberalism has come to refer to, liber to the liberation of fiscal and moral restraint. Well, over the last 200 years, classical liberalism has devolved largely into a question of how to liberalize trade, how to free the markets to free the people, and frankly, how to liberalize and loosen the standards for what we could consider coercion, statism, and legitimate property. These different standards exist because to right anarchists, property is freedom and refuge from the state. To left anarchists, though, property is theft and also murder, as well as impossible, all according to Proudhon. But perhaps most importantly, private property replicates all the worst defining attributes of statism, violence, monopoly, territoriality, and exclusivity, just on a micro scale instead of a macro scale. Those who feel the libertarian should support not only voluntary exchange in markets, but also capitalism and strong private property ownership rights, and self-ownership, which is the notion our bodies are a property that other property rights derive from those rights to our bodies, they are described as proprietarians often. This tendency within anarchism, excuse me, the tendency within anarchism, on the other hand, is to believe that nothing can justify the exclusive ownership of a parcel of land. It's called anti-proprietarianism. Another word for which is anidiotism, the word I've only seen used once, which evidently denotes the absence of individual ownership altogether. And idiotism, taken to the extreme, could potentially involve the liberation of the concept of personal possession together. But left-wing market anarchists, such as mutualists, do not oppose personal possession. They only oppose property. 
which is to say they oppose private property, by which they mean private property and the means of production. That is the ownership of land, labor, power, excuse me, land, labor, power, and capital by someone who has no need for it, who nevertheless leverages those assets to essentially charge employees rent for the privilege of using their tools. The owners and lenders of private capital, who Marx called bourgeoisie, insist upon their right of increase, their right to exact a greater amount each year, essentially based on the unchecked assumption that rent will continue to go up, currency will continue to inflate, and I have no motivation not to seek higher profits next year. And the species idea that a borrower can do anything but oppression and coerce into assenting to someone profit off of lending out wealth and capital and interest for the privilege of working hard every day to afford the means to get up and go to work the next day and to work yourself to death. If there are any New, De New Deal Democrats in the room, you're about to stop being a New Deal Democrat. Because Franklin Delano Roosevelt had an opportunity to sign into law a 30 hour work week, but he caved under pressure from entrenched money business interests. If that doesn't convince you that the government has no compassion for working people, I suggest you consider the possibility that require, being required to work more than you need to for no good reason isn't a way to imbue a society with a morality and a work ethic. It's a soft form of slavery. To compare being overworked to slavery is not to diminish the suffering of African Americans under slavery. It is to point out that Lysander Schooner, an abolitionist white man writing during Reconstruction, and Frederick Douglass, a black man who escaped slavery in 1838, agreed that so-called political slavery, oppression by government, is prone to the same degree of abuse and chattel slavery. In a similar vein, Marx and Proudhon agree that wage slavery, exploitation by employers, is comparable to slavery as well. And as we now know, political slavery can result in more slavery conditions for wage workers than the rest of the FDR. Although FDR was influenced by a real socialist, Norman Thomas, his order of the law worked just, I uh, just want to remind our speakers going pretty good. We uh, just want to keep them in, let them let them finish first before we get into side uh, bar conversations. Please continue, sir. Sure, sir. Although FDR was influenced by a real socialist, Norman Thomas, his theft of a quarter of all our working lives and his theft of a quarter of the value of the gold that his administration confiscated from the American public by turning around and selling it, in my mind, there's little cause for socialist progressive to conflict with convictions to honor this man. He was certainly not a liberal, at least not in the sense that that word means liberating the people by liberating the, limiting government's ability to run and ruin their lives. And he had little respect for ordinary working people's personal possessions, their savings, or their right to care more about their own ability to deal with stress and physical pain on the job rather than the profits of the person who's working in half the debt, expecting to save up enough to buy the land and capital necessary to create a socialist utopia of his own. This next part is about what anarcho-capitalists don't understand about left-wing market anarchism, and also what they do. Um, anarcho-capitalists apparently feel... Uh, if left, they apparently feel that if left-wing anarchists want their own land on which to build an intentional community and try socialism, they should purchase the land they want from whoever owns it. Of course, right off the bat, there's some problems with this. Of course, anarchists don't want their own land, at least not in the sense that property ownership is usually, as usually practiced, uh, involves domination, monopolization, exclusion, and often exploitation. They want collective management of the land, not necessarily ownership. Second, if socialists are supposed to buy the land they want, who are they supposed to purchase it from? Government that owns and manages most of it can charge whatever it wants and keep track of who owns it so they can show up at our homes and kill us for not paying taxes? Or are socialists supposed to buy from private owners, the ones who receive police protection and other privileges that are funded through theft from taxpayers? Either way, anarcho-capitalist answer has got nothing to do with anarchism. There's only one answer they can give left-wing radicals, which I'll accept, and I'll explain that in a moment. Third and finally, if socialists are supposed to buy the land from the government, then doesn't it matter how the government acquired the land in the first place? Buying land from someone who stole it is not a just way to acquire property. Some might answer this, this with, the land wasn't stolen, it was conquered. Well, conquest doesn't mean the land was wasn't stolen, it just means it was stolen, and then most of the people were never enslaved or murdered. Anarcho-capitalists understand very well the concepts of free will, free association, freedom from oppression, etc. They understand the freedom of and to association also involves freedom from association, the right to be left alone in private. Anarcho-capitalists also agree with left-wing market anarchists that peaceful trade through voluntary exchange of justly acquired possession is morally, morally unobjectionable in a great way to run the economy. Anarcho-capitalists also believe that free market, in a free market, transaction will take place on voluntary terms. What NCAPs seem to forget, though, is that we do not have a free market with a fair system. Some say that NCAPs and Volvers and Mies make the mistake of thinking free markets and capitalism are the same thing. The former Libertarian Party presidential candidate Ron Paul said during the debate, we've never had free markets. 
now that Donald Trump is in office, what we have is closer to mercantilism than the free market. It's unfortunate, though, that some libertarian and leftists alike seem to think that Trump is moving things towards free markets and still farther away from them. If any good or service is provided by government, quote unquote, through forceful or coercive means, then there are not free markets because not all markets are free from the collusive effects of forced threats and fraud. The economic system of the libertarian philosophy is free markets, not necessarily capitalism. Certainly not crony capitalism, corporatism, mercantilism, protectionism, autarky, or oligopoly. Although capitalism is popularly defined, especially by its supporters, as a system in which resources are primarily owned and traded by non-state actors, the term capitalism doesn't mean a state of free markets, free trade, and free competition, at least not as practiced. Sure, the ideal definition of capitalism sounds exactly like a free market system, but the way uh, the definition is set up causes people to assume that all businesses and, and enterprise are non-state or non-state affiliated actors. But the plethora of taxpayer-funded privileges they receive suggests otherwise. So does the fact that they usually pay less than what the taxpayers do for utilities, for better access to those utilities, like energy, internet, road access for commercial trucking, and also for exclusive privileges which would likely not exist in a free market and without government debt from taxpayers. Privileges which they can only get as a business, like intellectual property rights, incorporation, business charter, limited liability grants, for financial and legal protections, favorable professional licensing regulations which insulate them from competition, and legal mandates the citizens buy certain products and types of products, thus failing, failing out failing industries. Of course, when I say this, anarcho-capitalists probably think I'm echoing Barack Obama when he said you didn't build that, somebody else made that happen. I'm not saying that. I'm only saying that, uh, what 2004 Libertarian presidential uh, nominee Michael Badenarik said in his course on the Constitution. You don't own most of the things you think you own. Like I explained before, if you're in need and you have nothing to trade away, then you have, you have to sell your labor. If you want to avoid selling your labor, then you have to be able to fully own something before you can sell or trade it away. Because if you don't fully own it, you're just renting it, using it, or occupying it, you have to get someone else's permission to sell or trade it. Unless you have the manufacturer's statement of origin on your car, according to Bednar, it's not really your car. Because you don't know who produced it, who had all the original documents that would allow you to fully own it. And if you don't own the land, says Bednar, under your house in full loading title, that is the development rights, the water rights, and the soil rights underneath the house, you don't fully own it. And of course, if you rent a house or apartment that's not yours, you don't fully own your residence either. Anarcho-capitalists and right-wingers will talk about Colin Kaepernick and go on about, well, what if I own a football stadium? Well, you don't. So what a private owner of a stadium or a team does with it is none of your business. And you're not a libertarian if you think it is. And the patriotic displays you see in football games are heavily subsidized to promote American military propaganda. So you're not even talking about a non-state actor or anything that has to do with the free market. You're just saying what someone else should do with their own property. And that is tyranny. That's not freedom. In my opinion, the use of the word capitalism denotes a preference for the concerns of capital and industry over the concerns of labor and working people, just as socialism denotes the opposite. A free market system would not afford more rights to a person who owns physical or financial capital, nor to someone who doesn't, because each of them is just an individual who would be treated in proportion to how much he earned of his own effort to power what he has. Americans who buy and sell land are buying and selling stolen property, building other properties on top of it, and thinking that stolen property below it made it possible to accumulate that wealth upon it. And they're part right, it does. A strong government does foster the environment for wealth to accumulate, but they forget this founds a nation upon theft and calls it freedom. Since an anarchist, an anarcho-capitalist is a free market idealist who often forgets we're not in a free market, he sees a transaction, remembers that in a free market all transactions are voluntary, and so he wrongly assumes that the negotiation taking place is happening on totally voluntary terms. He fails to see how the terms of the transaction are constrained by unseen forces such as social pressure, rules and regulation which limit the number of available options, and taxes which disrupt normal prices and costs. And those forces are forces. Social pressure is coercive because it carries with it the underlying implicit threat of force, even if it is incredible or carried out. And the other forces are governmental. Um, basically, if a transaction occur occurs, then it must be voluntary. That doesn't mean that if a transaction occurs, then it must have been voluntary. It's a slight difference if you have to be able to recognize. Left-wing market anarchism says that yes, we should have freedom of association, free trade, markets, competition, free people, but also free cooperation, free movement, and yes, free stuff as long as it's freely given and freely received. Additionally, that if a transaction is to be described as fully voluntary, it must be mutually beneficial. That is, each part of the transaction must believe it is in its own rational self-interest to participate in it and feel that it satisfies its own subjective values and its particular wants. We live in a society. 
as the movement says, if anarcho-capitalists and radical individualists don't want to live in society, then they don't have to. They don't have to work or pay for society or government, as long as they don't receive any of the benefits. But if you want to live with and around other people and interact and transact with them in order to align individual interests with collective interests, not subvert individual interests to collective interests, then all transactions must benefit both or all people involved. In economics, this is referred to as a Pareto improvement after the Italian marginalist economist Wilfred Pareto. The idea that no, no agreement can be considered voluntary unless it harms nobody uh, is essential to creating not just voluntarism, but a voluntary society, voluntary collectives, voluntary cooperatives, communities participated in on a voluntary term. And that means the right to exit and enter any collective, whether it's a union, a non-unionized business, a cooperative enterprise, the army, citizenship itself, on terms mutually agreeable to the individual and collective in question. Individualist anarchist Max Stirner wrote in his book, The Ego in Its Own, if it is said socialistically, society gives me what I require, and the egoist says, I take what I require. If the communists conduct themselves as ragamuffins, the egoist behaves as proprietor. Uh, if a society or collective fails to live up to his end of the social contract, then the individual ought to be free to terminate that contract. That does not mean in any way that billionaires whose wealth is protected by the state and by banks and security firms insulated from competition by state power should be allowed to get off scot-free with taking their money, our money, overseas. That is, uh, I'm not saying to tax that money because I'm certain that the same government who gave them all that power and privilege also gets to do what they want with the money. They're just going to waste it instead of giving it back to the people. It's the people who are in the prime position and deserve to take that wealth back, not just hardworking taxpayers, because we're all taxpayers. Because at least in at least uh, in 46 states, there's the sales tax, so the poor pay taxes too. And the other four states without sales taxes, people are still using U.S. dollars, whose value is taxed through what Ron Paul calls the inflation tax on money. It's the whole of the people, whether they pay taxes or not, supposedly they don't, because we all suffer opportunity costs for not having our freedom recognized. So if society aims to protect people's needs and it punishes people for taking what they need from society's common and public wealth stores, then not only should individuals have the right to terminate those contracts unilaterally by tearing up an invisible piece of paper or by lighting an invisible piece of paper on fire, however they want to do it, the individual has the right, duty, and obligation to take back his share of what was stored up in the public and commonwealth on his behalf, paid for by his wealth and his work. The last few things that our capitalists don't understand, which I'd like to explain, First, not all communism is authoritarian. Second, not everything is property and capital. Three, acquiring property and justifying keeping it, especially if we're talking about a landowner, it takes a lot more effort than they're willing to admit, especially if you want to call yourself an anarchist. First, some anarcho-capitalists, especially those who lean towards the alt-right, believe libertarian socialism and voluntary collectivism are impossible because, uh, an oxymoron, because participation in a collective can never be voluntary and thus always has to be forced. They forget that they enter and leave collectives all the time in mutually voluntary agreeable terms. But they believe that everything which is not purely voluntary and geared towards the individual is collectivist, a term which they lump in, with which they lump in cooperative, communist, communitarian, socialist, nationalist, authoritarian, tyranny, and terms which have less to do with one another than they assume. They point to the big C communism in the USSR and cast it as the ultimate example of a collective, cooperative community. Union, socialism, totalitarian, totalitarian country, and small sea communism without knowing what any of those things are. Of course, it's not their fault. They're even progressive to forget that unions are not cooperatives. They're not egalitarian labor managed firms. They're not syndicates. They're certainly not workers' councils or Soviet. They're a feature of capitalism. Uh, Anarcho capitalists see the atrocities and failures of the Soviet Union. Assume that's what Bernie Sanders and supporters wants. Forget the history of sanctions, isolation, infiltration, uh, election interference, propaganda campaigns, coups, assassinations, and election interference, which, which the U.S. Has, and its allies have visited upon countries that attempt to redistribute public wealth. I mean, at some point, you got to ask yourself, people like Gaddafi and Hugo Chavez can't tax oil profits to establish a citizen's dividend fund without getting bombed and having coups attended against them. And when are we going to bomb Alaska and Norway for doing the same thing? Anyone who calls himself an ANCAP and mocks the victims of communism while ignoring the U.S. intervention that preceded its rise, whether disrupted or to help it, is not a friend of either anarchists or victims of extreme regimes. Second, anarcho-capitalists conflate land, labor, and capital, pretending that land and labor are capital. 
Marx called this commodification, the treatment of people, workers, the land, and other living things like mere pieces of dead physical property that can and should be viewed as physical or financial capital assets to be traded subject to ordinary market forces. This, of course, ignores the humanity of the person whose labor is being traded and ignores the living nature of the land which is being sold out from under the feet of the people who can't help but take up area and space on the planet. This relates to the concept of self-ownership, which I believe is flawed. If we remember John Locke, life, liberty, and property, you know, the life precedes liberty and liberty precedes property. But the rhetoric of self-ownership, on the other hand, seems to suggest that our bodies are our property and life is the property of its owner. But again, believing too strongly that our bodies are our property might trick us into thinking that our lives and bodies are subject to market forces, forces that ANCAPs incorrectly assume have nothing to do with collectives, and so they assume they're acceptable simply because it's occurring in the context of a market. This line of thinking might lead us to believe our bodies may be harmed and our lives may be taken away if we fail to respect people's ridiculous expectations about how to treat their property and how to behave while well on their property. And this is exactly what the extremely pro-private property capitalists who call themselves anarchists want us to believe. They want us to believe that all you need to do in order to justly acquire and justify keeping land is to claim it, put up a perimeter around it, and kill whoever trespasses. But wait, why do that? That requires work and vigilance. You can't be responsible without work and vigilance unless you create a weaponized perimeter that automatically kills trespassers. Anarcho-capitalists call this idea landmine homesteading. I say idea rather than practice because I hope it hasn't been tried. I don't know if it has. But back to my point, this is how ANCAPs think. They want to use their property to trap people, to create enclaves without easements, so they can do what the English government did to the commoners in the 1600s, the enclosure of the commons. Anarcho-capitalist obsession with trapping human beings, enclosure and borders, and Hans Hermann Hoppe's supporters' advocacy of physical removal of Democrats, socialists, and communists who supposedly can't respect other people's property are all extremely problematic obstacles to left-wing and right-wing anarchists getting along. Leaving aside the question of how you're supposed to physically remove someone from a covenant community whose membership is not based on area or territory at all, how can you ensure free trade into your community if it's closed off from the rest of the world by a border wall other fortifications? Like I explained earlier, this is how ANCAPs miss the fact that when they advocate for controls and impediments like this, they're replicating the cons conditions of the state on a small scale, not abolishing status. Perhaps most baffling of all, most libertarians still don't understand the argument for prohibiting discrimination, segregation, and baseless exclusion of patrons from enterprises offering public accommodations. The issue at the center of the matter is in the U.S. Supreme Court case, Heart of Atlanta Motel v. Motel v. U.S. and Title II of the Civil Rights Act of 64. Gary Johnson was the only Libertarian Party presidential candidate who said that he would have signed the bill to integrate restaurants, hotels, etc., but he declined to explain his reasoning. This is something most of the party seems to consider a betrayal. But Johnson has explained outside of the party's debates that he would not want to go backwards on what he sees as civil rights progress. Remember, enterprises are not strictly private property. They operate according to zoning laws and the terms spelled out in charters, are often publicly subsidized, if not through direct subsidies, then at least by loans and easy credit aided by, aided by monetary intervention that causes artificially low interest rates. They rest on property that's owned and or managed by government, but that doesn't stop handicaps and unfortunately religious conservatives from taking their business to be wholly their property and using that to justify excluding people without cause after they agree to abide by the anti-discrimination rules of their state while telling other people that they can immigrate illegally or break any other minor laws. They're hypocrites. An enterprise that receives taxpayer funding, assistance, or privileges of any kind should not be allowed to discriminate against the members of the public who pay those taxes for it to stay in business. The public who might be even required to buy their product directly according to the law in addition to indirectly through taxes and business welfare. Of course, this is an economic and constitutional argument, and whether we have, whether and when we have the right to conscientious objection in the workplace should not be just ignored in discussing this issue. You might be asking yourself, okay, so people need property to avoid, to be able to avoid working too hard and trade their things instead. But if you don't want them to own land and businesses, then what are they supposed to own and trade away? If certain communities want to own, allow people to own land, they should be able to do that, as long as they don't stop other communities from managing land in common. Personal possessions, that is, small, easily movable, often mass-produced things which are not essential to the production process and would not make sense to be owned by large numbers of people, can be owned. And we can own our vehicles and our homes and trade all those things at will because those things can be moved. But moving the land itself and earning land take a little more effort than just planting some lawns. It takes planting trees as well. So we get on to the topic again. What is left-wing market anarchism? and what it takes to earn property and make a fair trade. As the name suggests, this is a left-wing market anarchism. But what's market anarchism? 
a radical libertarian philosophy which theorizes that the state is intrinsically violent and aggressive, and intrusive in our political, economic, and social affairs, even those which harm nobody, and therefore it should be abolished. Additionally, that any and all goods and services we can want can and should be provided voluntarily through free exchange and markets without any state direction or interference. The left wing of market anarchism consists of all the anarchist schools of thought that find themselves caught between the social anarchists and the left, like Emma Goldman, and the market anarchists who sometimes call themselves ANCAPs and are farther than the economic right. While the anarchist left calls for social freedom and the anarchist right calls for economic freedom, those in the middle believe that both are possible in this article. While social anarchists develop alternative societal structures and lifestyles, which are alternative to government control and association, Market anarchists develop alternative economic mechanisms and systems and styles of exchange that serve as alternatives to the economic management and mismanagement, misallocation, and misdistribution which is performed by the state. As we would expect, those finding themselves in the middle do both It would be difficult to say whether these radical centrists or centrist anarchists are neither capitalist nor communist, or both capitalist and communist. But they are against totalitarianism, authority, fascism, decentralization of power, arbitrary decision-making power, undeserved authority, involuntary subjugation to government and the state. The anarchists in the center believe that an anarchist system which focuses too much on being specifically communist or capitalist will tend to make excuses for the use of force against anarchists exposing, espousing different um, economic ideologies. And of course, having used force makes it difficult to prove that you're a peaceful individual who can govern himself, take responsibility for himself, and exert the level of self-control which is necessary to live without government, so that anarchists can trust you to cooperate with them more than you can compete and differ with them. In order to avoid the extremes associated with focusing on implementing a particular economic system more than implementing anarchism, left-wing market anarchists feel the need to find an economic system in the center, which allows individuals and collectives, and individuals and other individuals, transact on mutually agreeable and mutual beneficial terms. In the late 19th century, individualist and mutualist strains of anarchism appeared, and people like Pierre Joseph Proudhon, Max Stirner, Lysander Spooner, Josiah Warren, and Benjamin Tucker formed the center ground of anarchism. This coalition formed a set of anarchist tendencies which is easily reconcilable with the farther left anarchist tendencies according to anarcho-syndicalists like Rudolf Rocker and anarcho-communists like Eric Malatesta. But at that time, another current of anarchism was beginning to take shape, the one which gave rise to the libertarian movement. In the mid-1800s, France, classical liberal C. Frederick Bassiat served with Proudhon in the French National Assembly on the same side, the left, that's right, a classical liberal on the left side of the government. Bassiat, who wrote a book called The Law, had a protege named Gustave Molinari, uh, the Belgian economist after whom the Libertarian Molinari Institute is named at the Center for a Society in Alabama. Mark Molinari wrote the, pro uh, the production of security in response to the Paris Commune of 1848 criticizing the commune arts for establishing a monopolistic version of supposedly stateless communism, but which resembled a state. He could be considered the very first market anarchist thinker, save for perhaps the businessman who first said was a fair in the mid-1600s. So now we come to the central ideas of left-wing market anarchist thought, the ideas of Henry George, Benjamin Tucker, Josiah Warren, Pierre Joseph Proudhon. I'll also touch on the ideas of John Locke and Thomas Paine, two people it's a little hard to argue were actually anarchists, but whose ideas also help provide an American political context to those often radical ideas. I mentioned earlier that FDR was influenced by the socialist Norman Thomas. Thomas was in turn influenced by the 19th century American economist and social theorist Henry George. George's 1879 book, Progress and Poverty, uh, was published. George's philosophy came to be known by many names. Georgism, Geoism, the single tax, and land value taxation, or LBT. George advocated a free market in everything but land while uh, arguing that land value should be taxed while the value of homes, buildings, and human activity should not. George wanted to tax not property value but the so-called unimproved value of land, more or less the value of the effort it would take to return the land to its natural state. The single tax, which would also aim to simplify taxes in the process, think no more income taxes, no more sales taxes, would intentionally deter the exclusive ownership of land. Knowing that we get less of whatever we tax, LVT would tax destruction but not production, leaving people free to produce and keep what they produce. The tax, more accurately, a rent payable to what is called a community land trust at a value determined by land value markets which are inclusive and immune from influence by speculation would deter blight, disrepair, abuse, waste, pollution, and the hoarding of common natural resources, land, air, water, etc. Many modern Georgists also wish to deter externalities by imposing Peruvian taxes named for economists of the Peru. Externalities are consequences of decisions that affect people who do not choose by, to be affected by those decisions. 
In extreme form, Georgism might involve carbon taxes, decisions, dividend, and more taxes intended to deter behavior based on unfounded moralizing. To impose the latter would certainly be anti-libertarian and prevent libertarians and Georgias from coalescing around a geo-libertarian idea, an example of whom is Libertarian Party co-founder, one of the developers of the political compass, David Norn. Other supporters of George's philosophy include Milton Friedman, Joseph Stiglitz, Mason Gaffney, Mark Twain, Frank Lloyd Wright, Aldous Huxley, and Winston Churchill. Uh, the George School of Social Science right here in Chicago and the George's group Common Ground and is active in at least 10 or 15 metropolitan areas around the U.S. LBT and, ex and an experimental version called Split Rate Taxation have been tried in communities in Pennsylvania, Alabama, Maryland, New York, Estonia, and Singapore. Numerous Pennsylvania towns have found it to reduce blight, pollution, waste of land, the number of abandoned properties, rent, property taxes, and unemployment. Henry George's idea was essentially that if you want to own land, you have to compensate the community you bought it from. It seems a very free market. For the cost the community occurs uh, from whatever protections and privileges it, occurs, it gives to you as a result of recognizing your land claim and granting you a land title which is usually deemed a necessity, basic services, such as recorder, deeds office, other registrar of land titles, zoning laws, a police force, of course, in which property disputes may be resolved. Thomas Paine, the author of Common Sense, essentially argued the existence of these services deprives people of their natural right to fully own and inherit land. So he argued that each adult citizen receive an annual sum as compensation. The other big idea of Henry George is that an idea he also touched, idea also touched on the work of Benjamin Tucker. That a person who claims a parcel of property for himself must contribute to the sustainable cultivation and improvement of the land. Libertarian Michael Van Ark argued in his constitution class that if someone owns land and owns a house on it, they can do whatever they want with their own property without asking or applying for permission. Knock their house down, dismantle it piece by piece, even set it on fire. Knocking down and dismantling your house are fine because they arguably don't affect anyone else unless you love your property values and your homeowners association so much that you hate eyesores with an all consuming passion. But setting your house on fire creates externalities, it pollutes air that other people have to breathe. I'm going to have to cut this short, but suffice it to say, you can read this on my blog later today. Um, I'm just going to talk about Jean Jacques Rousseau. Um, he's the first, he said that the first person to cordon off a parcel of land and claim it was his started modern society, and the first person to believe it was a fool. You don't earn land by setting traps, planting bombs, and setting your house on fire, obviously. The point is to homestead it, as John Locke explained. Make it livable, cultivate it, and make improvements to it that are sustainable. If you can't do that, you probably don't deserve it, especially if you think you have no respons responsibility to defend it, or think you can simply pay poor and needy people to do it for you, who, by the way, know you don't care about their well-being, and they have the keys to your property. I'm a security guard, by the way. It also doesn't make sense to claim that you own property if you never go there, occupy it, or use it, whatever it is. Uh, this idea is called use fractory property rights, or use-based property rights. Proudhon and the mutualists argue against absentee property ownership and argue a person must personally and frequently use and occupy the property he claims to own. Modern mutualists observe that in America, six empty residences exist for each homeless person, so then there's no reason to use taxpayer money to hire police and licensed security guards like me, according to state prescribed standards, to protect empty homes, things like empty homes, like that. protect banks that speculate and make investments and keep the value of the homes artificially high, preventing the housing markets from clearing so that everybody can be housed at affordable prices or even for free. Remember, mass production uh, is designed for mass consumption. Yeah. We're preventing yeah. the markets from clearing. Okay. One last sentence. So the mutualists support the right to squat on unused, undeveloped, and unabandoned property, especially when the property was acquired by the claimant by unjust methods. Thank you know, you covered a lot of ground. Give me your speech in three or four sentences and what the main ideas were that we should take away tonight from your talk. Sure. So basically the problem is that people of the right who claim they're libertarians don't understand that socialists understand property better than they do. They understand that living things cannot and should not be taken as property and subjected to ordinary market forces where they can be used as abused as if they are property. And uh, part of recognizing that we're living in society, even if you don't recognize it, you have to interact with other people, if, even if you want to just do market stuff like NCAPs do. And you have to be able to 
negotiate with them on some kind of firm ground, and you have to understand where it comes from, and how the government got its property, why it's immoral to legitimize the government by just doing what they doing with your own property, what they tell you to do, getting the property how they tell you to get it. It's, it just plays into fascism and leads us all to become fascists. Okay. Next Consider question. Because it's real. All right. Next here. Is a, a left wing market anarchist is that the same thing as a right wing social anarchist? And is and if so, why don't you just call them a centrist anarchist? I think centrist anarchist is a is a better application. Um, left wing is kind of you know the left wing market anarchists are those libertarians who lean towards the center. Really, it's between the center and the libertarian party, which is a bit more to the left. But um, a right wing social anarchist is kind of someone who considers that nationalism, individualism, and markets are sometimes good. Um, sometimes that can call other socialists to say cause other socialists to say that they're not anarchists really, but they are the kind of people that we can convince to uh, to listen to our philosophy. It is requested that our speaker try to be a little more succinct. Yeah, yeah. Our, uh, you say you're a member of IWW. I'm one too. But uh, would you say IWW is libertarian or socialist or anarchist? Well, they're in a way they're they're libertarian socialists. Um, there are members who are Marxist Leninists. I'm a mutualist and belong to it. Um, they don't accept members who have subordinates who work in a way that has uh, where they're the boss of somebody. Um, in some cases, they actually allow that. But they are there is a very libertarian streak to them, and they they are skeptical of what the federal government's doing with labor, whether it's Republican or Democrat in office. Okay. Hey, would you say? America is a capitalist country? It, it's more capitalist than it is socialist, but it's mercantilism with a social safety net. <laughs> okay, good. Go ahead. All right. So, uh, is there a uh, libertarian plan for Peoria? Speak up louder. Is there a libertarian plan for Peoria? Um, in, uh, I'm not from Peoria. I just got that shirt here. I got this shirt there. Um, the Libertarian Party platform is, I'm sure it's available online at the national website. Charlie. Yeah, Joe, am I correct that you don't like the Wagner Act where employees take a Democratic vote and you don't think that people that lose the vote, your political science degree, people who lose the vote shouldn't go along with the winning vote? Yes. Could you tell me what where votes take place that those who lose a vote don't have to agree to the winning measure? Well, it's, it's federal In law. the world, one example where you don't have to do that. Thank you. Where you don't have to abide by a Democratic decision that you've already yeah. agreed to participate in? Yeah, the, I mean, you can force people to submit to a Democratic decision. If you want, but that's that requires using force. Is there um, any example you, you can give me where you do not have to go along with the majority? It's called a coup d'état, Charlie. The world. I don't know that I can. Well, the, not the, the only the world, example I can cite is any time someone was resisting the a government or elected union. The way, okay, so you need to watch a video from 1989, Mike Sinto show in Ohio, a guy named Reed Larson of the National Right to Work Foundation came in and explained, it's is because, the it's Wagner because Act of the Wagner Act. Act than a, a, why is that vote different? The Wagner Act creates free riders. It requires people who don't agree to that majority union. It requires them to submit to support by it. Well, don't you have to in any vote? When you, you have to? When you lose. I mean, can I say Trump's not my president? Yes, uh, you just said that and no one killed you, yeah. I can, oh, uh, thank <laughs> you. You go know, uh, science graduate, you made an assertion that you can't give me an example of. An example you that someone me is, watch a video. let me ask you, and you're asking for an example of some, a time when someone has resisted a collective imposing its will on you? You have a right to disregard the majority decision. Yes. Because oh, we're individuals. Next question. Yes, next question. Next, Jonathan. Yes, All right. Every four years, the opinion of the majority of Americans based on uh, our opposition to wars of aggression for various moral and economic reasons are best representative, to my knowledge, by the Libertarian Party and the Green Party candidates. 
How do we break out of this cycle of being uh, sheep and being duped by the corporate media who refuse to tell us about these two very significant parties and their public policy uh, suggestions of how to not get locked in into these imperialist wars every single day? By working together ideologically, even though the government is trying to stop people, stop third parties from working together um, to collect signatures, you can collect for more than one party, uh, even though Greens and Libertarians want to work together around a geo-libertarian coalition that I've suggested, and expand and branch out further to socialists on the left and constitution party people who display war on the right. And I think they should continue to hold these free and equal debates. It's too bad that the one in 2016 didn't include Stein and Johnson. Um, but I'd like to see more of that more in a broader coalition against fascism that includes cons real full guard conservatives who aren't racist, the ones of them that aren't, and socialists. And just a quick follow-up. You know, so many people either didn't vote, so I, I consider that a no-confidence vote, or voted for Johnson or Stein. It seems like in an actual participatory democracy, we should count that as a we don't accept Trump or Clinton vote. in some kind of national dialogue. Maybe it might won't count towards the actual vote tally to decide who's president, but we should have a serious discussion over if this many people are unhappy with these two candidates, we got a serious crisis on our hands that's it's not going to go away. Yeah, and then we have 80% uh, re-election rates for Congress and 10 to 20% disapproval ratings. If we don't have participatory uh, elections, um, I, I've heard that New Hampshire has a very uh, inclusive participatory democracy that we can look towards. And you know, there's plenty of types of election reforms that I was taught about in political science class, like rank preferential voting, that could you know open primaries, things like that, can allow us to have you know maybe the second choice, if, if everybody's second choice, maybe he'd be better than both of the first choice. Yeah, uh, 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 well, how, how can the Libertarian Party uh, repeal the IRS and abolish, uh, repeal the income tax and abolish the IRS? <laughs> I, I read that in, your, uh, in the statement about the Libertarian yeah, well, I mean, uh, I suggested uh, Georgia's on, like, having the communities tax people for the use of land and not taxing basically anything else. And, you know, like, if we get rid of the, well, we have to delegitimize the amendment that created it. We have to repeal it. We have to cons look into it. It might have even been passed uh, under, you know, it might have not even been passed according to, you know, actual rules. It was rushed through during a Christmas session when everyone wanted to go home. And uh, so we should revisit that. We should. There have been people who, who have said to the public, I'll give you $100,000 and you can actually find a federal a piece of federal legislation that specifically says you have to pay your income tax to the federal government. No one's taking them up on it. we have, we got to find it, we got to admit that it doesn't exist. We have to maybe have a formal amendment to repeal it forever. Because we did without it until 1913, except for a brief period during the Civil War. We can do it out again. Okay. All right. Uh, hey. Mr. Travis. Um, <clears throat> Lenin said that if you want to conquer another country, first confuse their language. That concept also applies to confusing other countries' ideals. So if you go in and you set up all kinds of different organizations that conflict with one another and create a chaos, it's much easier to walk in and uh, take over, which is, by the way, pretty much how Hitler did it in Germany. There were many conflicting groups. The Nazis came in and they offered one thing and they made it where they seemed to make sense. Well, the question is that uh, as a libertarian, I believe that I have a right to my property, whether it's money or land or merchandise. It, what is mine belongs to me, and no one has a right to forcibly take it from me. And so with what you're talking about, with all these different groups 
anarcho-sociologist, uh, this and that, and the other thing, okay? It just confuses the issue. The fact is, if I believe in okay. capitalism, then if somebody says, well, now, here, here, if you compromise with okay. me and go along with this, um, all right. with these few socialist things, then, you know, we'll all question. be better yeah. okay. off. What's That's the... asking me, or attempting to persuade me, to okay. go away from my core beliefs. And with what you're talking about okay. here, you have umpteen different ones, and each one is offering to do that. It seems to me to be a lot of hogwash. Okay, so what's the question? The quest question <laughs> is, isn't that what it seems to be? Uh, not to me. I think you were right to point out that if you want to conquer a country, you have to confuse our language. And I've tried to explain how the fight over the words radical, libertarian, anarchist, uh, liberal, federalist, and socialist, um, even whether Nazis are socialists, there's been a big subject of dispute that stopped us from understanding each other and getting along with each other. So I hope this hasn't been hogwash. I hope it's helped explain. I know it's very verbose and there's a lot of technical language in there, but um, and there's this idea called geo-mutualism, that Georgism and mutualism and anarchists, they can all get along, form a centrist economic system that balances the extremes of communism and capitalism. Uh, I'm not saying that you're extreme for being a capitalist. Um, I'm, I'm just saying that you have to realize this money you think you own, it's owned by the government and they can take it from you anytime they want. So why is it, I mean, of course it's wrong for me to force, you know, for me to rob you at gunpoint or something, but, you know, Collectivists saying that maybe the community owns the commons is not that unreasonable with them. And that you should compensate them. It's just a free market idea. Okay, let's give our speaker a big hand tonight. <laughs> 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 okay, we enter our famous rebuttal stage. Uh, Let's have a show of hands so we can get a count of how many people expect to come up and give a rebuttal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Charlie's eight. So it's eight people. Well, we'll go with our usual four minutes then. Okay, who's first? Um, why don't I go first? No, I, uh, I'm going before Jonathan because I'm going to be passionate. All right, we usually get four minutes. Charlie, we have made an executive decision now to uh, go into question periods. No, that's bullshit. We used to get at least two questions, and that's not funny, pal. I don't know. Yeah, we used to get a second round. Can we say who hasn't had a chance yet? What happened to that? Who else needs a question? Executive decision. What? If we had 10 minutes of questions. Well, we wanted to get some time in for rebuttals. Yeah, do you want, do you want, uh, you're the only one objecting, Charlie. It doesn't matter. I object too. Yeah, he doesn't like it either. So here's, there. A, here's an occasion yeah, where the objections are one over. Yeah. So it's just to say, go around the Go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. We have. No, you don't. We're, we're, we're subjecting, this is an instance of where, of, of where, you just you saw an instance. Yes. 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 No yes. 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 Go ahead. I That's not, good. I know. We didn't take a vote. Yes. All right. The the libertarians claim that they can uh, give uh, the average worker a hundred twenty four thousand dollar pension for the rest of his life. I read that in the literature. How can you do that? 124,000, they only make 36,000. Yeah, that, that sounds high. We definitely want, uh, you know, pensioners to not receive upwards of $50,000 unless they're actually good at something and are experts in their field. Pension, pension. Yeah. I'm sorry if I don't understand your question. Could you... It's in your literature here that the average person can get a $124,000 pension annual for the rest of his life. In your, in your literature. I, I haven't read that particular pamphlet, but are, 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 you, are you saying that they could receive it, like if the government continues to grow, or that they're receiving it now? Or? They make that claim, that if they uh, got rid of Social Security and had a pension fund, 
and invested in pension fund that they, they could uh, 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 that they could stock fund that they can get 124,000 a year. I don't know where that particular estimate comes from, but so the, liber so the libertarian theory go. I'd like to see the source on that. Sure, I'll, I'll look at it. But uh, the libertarian idea about pensions is that if individual workers can control and self-direct their their uh, their pension, then um, they will be able to make wiser decisions than the state could, because the state has to actually profit off of them rather than protect their wealth. All right. Who else has a question? Charlie, you better have an inherent function of government to take from the rich and give to the poor so they don't die of starvation? Uh, no, that's what Robin Hood did when he was stealing from the government. So they, the poor, should die of exposure and starvation? Robin Hood stole money from the government that it has stolen from the people and gave it back to the people. The government doesn't steal from the rich and give to the poor. Robin Hood did that, and he was okay. hurt. He, he was pursued by the government. He's a special character. But. So the, the people, the government should do nothing. Yes, we can all do it ourselves. And, and if there's the, something the government when, does. Despite that, hardship of the population. The government killed 200 million of its own people in the 20th century. The government that should do again. nothing in the faith. Yes, it should do nothing by stopping the killing right. people and supporting the terrorist hardship. groups. All right. All right. Are you satisfied? There's a group called Food Not Bombs that gives people food for free. That's fine. Any other questions? Are you now satisfied, Charlie, that we can move the rebuttals? Well, the group. You go around, does anyone have done? You know, this so we don't need to do it. Okay, you know that. Well, you want to start the rebuttal period now? All right, people? start. Let's take it from All right, go ahead. I'll yes, go later. Yes, my, um, my rebuttal is pretty much what I said in my question then. <clears throat> when you say, okay, you're a libertarian, but if you'll compromise with me a little bit on this socialist programs, then we can kind of have a mixed bag economy that'll work out real nice for everyone. And we tried that ever since uh, before uh, Franklin Roosevelt with the New Deal economics, which has ultimately led to where we're at today. So uh, my argument is to be, to hold fast to your beliefs and only be persuaded to change your mind if you're confronted with logic. Uh, Ann Rand said she'd be glad to go over to socialism if you could persuade her with logic, but she insisted that socialism was very illogical, which I agree with. Uh, so the fact is that uh, by giving in and compromising and, and uh, coalescing with other groups, it doesn't cure any of the problems. Give me a minute. When our founders set up our system and we had capitalism within we, when we started our great nation, America, after we finished our war with England, we were as broke as a skunk. We had nothing. And within 50 years, we were out producing the rest of the world combined. Uh, and we were, people were free to invent things. So people like Robert Bolton, who made the steamboat and so on, it made it possible for America to progress. When you start saying, well, we need laws to say that uh, people can't do this and they can't do that because it takes an unfair advantage of this other group and therefore we have to change over and so on, all of that is a lot of hogwash. We need to have freedom. We need to be free, and if we need to enforce anything, we need to enforce freedom. Now, I'm going to make one other comment. I'm going to make one other comment as an aside. I want to say that our speaker, who I'm sure researched this very good, 
and work very diligently to do all of that. I nevertheless have a criticism of our speaker, and I, I think that um, he ought to really um, uh, look into that. Our speaker is terribly monotone, so that when you say, okay, now is this is what we got to do, and it goes on like that the whole time, it puts everyone to sleep. So our speaker needs to do a little bit of boning up on public speaking. Thank you all. All right. I think that a little bit of Toastmasters. What do you say? I think that a little bit of Toastmasters. I can't hear him. Okay, thank you to the speaker for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm going to beat Coach uh, Jonathan tonight. So how many uh, basketball fans do we have here tonight by a show of hands? Basketball? We were, th we were three quarters, or we were what? You're talking about football or basketball? Three halves away a couple months ago from a national championship from Loyola, and we had the NBA Finals last month. So just pretend I'm a coach uh, and a play from the NBA Finals. So you had a uh, couple seconds left, and you had a guy shooting a free throw. So this will be the hoop right here. Okay. That's the hoop. Doesn't look like a good hoop, but it's a hoop. And he missed it. So there's five guys on the court, right? Okay. And I'm trying to make this a comparison as quick as I can within three and a half minutes. There's five guys on the court. All right, so four guys on the court were aware of what was going on. Just like some people in America are aware of what's going on in civics, four guys on the court were aware of what was going on on the court in the game one of the NBA Finals in Oakland, California at the Oracle Arena. So the free throw was missed and they were tied. So the one guy who got the rebound you should have the uh, presence of mind to try to take a shot, right? Because you're tied at the end of the game. Okay? But he thought they were up by one point. So what he thought is, let's run out uh, the, the uh, time or let's get a, a free throw, another free throw attempt. So he went away from the goal of what the whole entire entity is about. You go there to score points, right? So. Uh, we call this in basketball, you didn't have good court awareness. All right? Thank you. And I think the speaker was excellent tonight uh, on the question I asked because we have a media that makes us not aware of what's actually going on in civics. Okay? We have a media that doesn't tell you what your values obviously are known to the media most. <laughs> You want to know what's going on with these candidates. What are their policies that are going to spend your treasure, take your trust, take your time, and probably, possibly your life if you're in the armed services. Sent overseas for some imperialists, let's go get some more oil, let's go get some more water. Wall Street runs the, the show uh, 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 money. So what I would say is, uh, we've gone too far towards the wrong direction, the opposite direction in America in all our lifetimes. We've gone towards militarism, we've gone towards lack of workers' rights, we've gone towards lack of uh, free elections. We need to go in the opposite direction. Peace, workers' rights, and people who agree that we can do a lot better than what we're doing in civics go towards the goal, have civic awareness, the same way that a great player that deserves to be on the court has court awareness. And how do we do that? Well, you got to say no to corporate television, and that's hard to do. But I think we have the will. At least the people in the room here tonight and our speaker, I get good feelings and I'm very optimistic about our future here in this country, despite the fact that we have a guy who uh, not only is president, but he says, let's burn down the whole stadium. Let's not only not go to the hoop, let's Let's cause extinction, just make him, you know, Superman of, of history at the end. So thank you to our speaker. And I'll hold that capitalistic ball in the basket. Yeah, boy, 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 bo
this guy. He's not even going to talk about it. I, I want to say thanks, thanks to the speaker for, for his education. Uh, I wish he would put a little more uh, personalization into, this, into the talk instead of all these facts. I have a poem. I have a poem. Is this speaker? Is this? Uh, it's on. Don't worry. On? We can hear it. We can right. hear you. Okay. It's called "Resist My People, Resist Them." Resist my people, resist them. In Jerusalem, I dressed my wounds and breathed my sorrows and carried the soil in my palm for an Arab Palestine. I will not succumb to the peaceful solution, never lower my flags until I evict them from my land. I cast them aside for a coming time. <coughs> Resist my people, resist them. Resist the settlers' robbery and follow the caravan of martyrs. Share, shred the disgraceful constitution which imposed degradation and humiliation and deterred us from restoring justice. They burned blameless children. As for Hadil, they sniped her in public, killed her in broad daylight. Resist my people, resist them. Resist the colonialist onslaught. Pay no mind to his agents among us who chain us with the peaceful illusion. Do not fear doubtful tongues. The truth in your heart is stronger. As long as you resist in a land that has lived through raids and victory, so Ali called from his grave, resist my rebellious people. Write me as prose on the wood. My remains have you as a response. Resist my people, resist them. Resist my people, resist them. This is a poem by Darin Tatur, who was put in prison for eight years for this poem and some other things she did. Thank you very much. All right. All right, next. You're up, Raj. Get up there. Yeah, what side are you on, Raj? My name is Raj Patel. And uh, when I heard about speaker, I made a one day travel, print out. And I thought he was very smart, very articulate, very intelligent. And that came out to be true. He was very knowledgeable. And, uh, but problem was that, yeah. I didn't get a single thing. I didn't understand, you know, because uh, it's, it, it's a kind of a going to nuclear physics class and you go to whole lecture and you don't know unless, uh, unless you are a student of nuclear physics, okay? And, uh, the, and this is going on with the Democratic Party, on this with nickel dime, with the Green Party and uh, whatever party you like, yeah. You know, and uh, they talk and talk and talk and talk and this and this and great idea and nothing happens. And uh, this is like Hillary Clinton talking. You know, she talk and talk and talk and talk and at the end of the well, her one hour speech you don't get nothing. You know, but Donald Trump comes and he says, you know, get to it you know, from south, shut the water out and kick them out. And everybody understood. You know, and, they, and, and that's what I'm saying. I, I think American problems are not only solved with these people, this crowd. We will do this and that and that and become, we become a, hey, Jesus help me. You know, our, the Democratic Party don't believe in religion, but they are really very religious people. They are like, a, talk like a faithful. Like a God, help us, you know, and rain, rain the dollars and sand, and it's going to come down. And it's not coming down. Barack Obama did a lousy job, did not, did not come out, okay? okay so. Bill Clinton did a good job, but you know what kind of guy he was, you know, he was in closer, okay? And uh, it bothers me, what, okay, let me give you one idea what I like to do, okay? I think this world is going to get a better, and whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. It's a big guy to have population management. 
We can do many different. What problem we have is very simple. If anybody wants to do it. The people who are well off, people that are more educated, who are making their money, they don't want to make babies. And that way good. And people who are begging on a welfare and all this and that, and they, they are popping out kids like a it's litter. That is your problem. And unless you solve that problem, then nothing going to happen. You know, and I say, hey, come on, let's do it. You know, people, poor people, want, poor people shut them off like a student did it. Poor people tax them more, and rich people tax them less because rich people make money anyway. Okay, and then make country run. And this is this, this, this is central problem. Look, we have people in a two million people in the prison. What do we need them for? Okay, if a if a guy guy rapes somebody, they chop him off and get it over with. Guy who kills somebody, you know, chop it. Hey, guy, guy is calling you, giving you mother we need. Okay, send him to heaven. Okay, we the tech. Future technological society is not going to buy your bullshit what you are talking about. All right. Okay, my time is done? No, not quite okay. yet, but slow. So, so the mm -hmm. problem, problem is this, that we have to be realistic. What we can, what we, what works, what does not work. Like it not, the Donald Trump's uh, treatment of North Korea, you know, we don't hear in the morning that North Korea anymore. Every morning we used to turn on news and say North Korea is going to kill or we are going to go to war and everybody worry about we will going to have war. Nothing happened, everything will work out. Thank you very much. All right. Hey guys, Justin again. I really, I really appreciate uh, Joe's lecture. Uh, I like uh, it. Uh, I, I especially like how he uh, talked about etymology and, and words, and that's important. And I, th uh, I think that because of how libertarians are in the modern time, uh, we forget that like uh, people like Carl Hess and, uh, and Sam Conkin and all these other uh, folks do have a, uh, you know, do have a, their place in the Libertarian Party history, and we should uh, Keep uh, you know ensure that they you know have a legacy there as well. So thank you, Joe, for doing that. All right. Good night. Good night. Okay. We'll do. We'll do. Got here a little late. Sorry. Hi, my name is Adam Balling. I'm a local volunteer with the Libertarian Party and the uh, precinct committeeman at Edgewater where I live. Thank you. Joe, I'm sorry I got here a little late. Did you have any chance to mention Spencer? I had to cut it out to the end. Yeah, right, then I'll throw it in. There is an excerpt from Herbert Spencer's uh, first big book from about 1850 or 51, Social Statics, The Right to Ignore the State. And I think this could come in handy for a question the gentleman in the back asked earlier, and that we discussed a little bit informally the last time I was here as an audience member, uh, about many things which you echoed yourself about how you have the right to ignore the force of the state. Individuals have the right to dissolve themselves from certain arrangements. And sir, in the back you'd asked about how that could apply to the Wagner Act specifically. And I think I'll use this analogy. If you were a Jehovah's Witness and you did something they didn't like, they could disfellowship you, but that's not backed by the government. Uh, unless you want to talk about tax exempt status that churches get. But other than that, uh, there's no force that the witnesses have behind them other than their agreement to say we don't want you to come to services anymore in this group of Jehovah's Witnesses. There'd be no law on top of that backing it up and you might be digging in the wrong place for uh, the analogy and if Joe had a hard time summoning up an example. And in terms of what right we have to ignore 50% of the votes plus one, if 50% of the voters and their representatives plus one vote outlawed alcohol, does that make it unjust for you to drink alcohol? Well, we went through that experience about 90 years ago with drug law in California uh, and Colorado and Oregon and Alaska and Washington State. Well, I am talking. You can come up. 
I don't like it when it impinges on constitutional liberty. Come on, please. All right. Oh, he doesn't want to vote. Yeah. Charlie, yeah. you're yeah. violating yeah. our yeah. fundamental yeah. rule. Answer, answer. I it was one pool at a time. Trying. It's but, one uh, pool at a time. What kind of votes do you like? What kind of votes do I like? None. Well, the ones that are the yeah, most number of choices, here. but the notion that 50% of the voters plus one vote have the right to govern all of your decisions thenceforth, like, hey, we voted for Shiism, you're a Sunni, sorry. Like, what is the value in that, sir? I think there's a limit to what the majority can impose upon the individual or the minority. I can see I threw some dynamite in the water. Good. I'll keep my time short. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, we got a couple more going. Hi, I'm David. Um, I uh, I appreciate the speaker coming. I thought the topic was really interesting. Um, a lot of history, which I think is important, and uh, I I hope uh, I wish he had more time to talk more about um, the main idea of the market. Um, uh, anarchism. So, uh, thanks that it came. Uh, this is uh, basically, uh, I'm going to talk about something that, and I don't want to rip somebody's idea off because this is the article from the Sun Times on June 17 uh, in the business section by Josh Boak, B O A K. Um, uh, basically, uh, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, at a press conference and announced that we have some of the lowest levels of unemployment in decades, it's down to 3.8%. So at this point, I want to ask people to not jump up in the air and start applauding for Donald Trump because there's a slight hitch to that. Our fearless leader promised that because of his business acumen uh, that he would come in and help people increase their wages because he just knows how to do things because he's a billionaire. Well, the problem is, is that the reporters were asking Mr. Powell, if uh, unemployment is so low, how come wages aren't going up? Basic economics. If you have a, uh, in a increasing size in the, uh, in the work, the job pool, if employers are having problems finding workers to fill jobs, wages are going to go up, but they're not. So uh, he said, well, it's not a mystery, but it is a puzzle. So this article, uh, and I'm glad they did the research because this was all new to me and I thought maybe you'd be interested in uh, hearing it. Listed five different reasons that people are kicking around, economists are kicking around as to explain this phenomenon. The first one is uh, there's a long-standing decline in union membership. And uh, we know that there's one party to thank for the, uh, for the difficulty that unions are having in uh, collective bargaining. Uh, the second point, increasing competition with foreign workers. It's hard for people to have a, a work a living wage in this country when people in other countries are being paid 10% and the countries have significantly less regulation over that uh, over those industries. Third point: uh, higher higher wages in this country are being are concentrated in the tech industry. So you're seeing a lot of these increased wages being absorbed by the tech industry, and people in under other industries are just being left at the wayside. Uh, number four: some workers are being forced to sign non competition agreements. This is a new technique of corporations. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, you don't have a lot of options if this is your main way of making a living and you can't go looking for other jobs for a year or two in the same industry. The final point I found most fascinating. It's something called monopsony. Has anybody here heard that term? No. Okay. Four people have. I've never heard of it, and I just thought this was fascinating. Monopsony is the term that economists use to describe the situation when there are just a very few large employers in an industry or a community. 
So basically, they're, they have a huge amount of control in the over the employers and, their, and the wages they're paid. Which, and, and I have a real hang up with these huge mega corporations like Walmart, which Walmart is one of the biggest employers in the United States, and yet they're paying people property wages, and when they walk in the door, the first thing they do is they teach them how to apply for food stamps. So everybody talks about the new jobs being created, but nobody says the cost of the community and how it's hurting middle class people and people with small businesses or family owned businesses that are put out of business because of these mega corporations. So it, I, I'm not really sure I, I agree with the speaker's, uh, uh, the speaker's ideas or his philosophies, but I greatly appreciate the passion that he's putting forward to try to find a, uh, a solution to a system that is rigged for working class, it's rigged against working class people. So, um, uh, thank you. All right. Well, Charlie, you know, there is a solution to these problems with workers and property rights. It's called, two things have to happen. The reason why America is successful most of the time in its capitalistic system is that property rights and title are generally recognized. According to a economist by the name of Hernando de Soto who wrote a book called The Mystery of Capital, the mystery of capital was just that. Once the poor have access to various assets that they already use, like their land, like their title, like, and they can leverage that monetary stuff and bank it or get clear title to it, then a, a country can prosper. What I heard tonight from our speaker was a lot of kind of a stuff along those lines, but the bottom line is if you have more capital and capitalists, it's not that the poor are not poor because of their own effort or their substandard, it's just because they don't have access to the resources that most of us would take for granted. You know, a poor person in a country like Egypt would take 17 years for him to own his house, going through every piece of government thing. Well, all we have to do is just come up with the funding and the capital, and maybe go through a couple of hours of closing costs with the realtor. And yes, there are certain licenses and things we do, but far less to own a home here than it would be in a foreign country. And the other thing is we have, because we have things like car titles, Things like uh, you know certificates of uh, ownership, stock, that kind of stuff. I think we're a lot better off with implementing a capitalistic system. In most of the countries in the world, the poor don't have access to that stuff because of the few not wanting them to have it. And second, if we could get these large mega corporations, some of whom have created the very things that they're supposed to represent, like barriers to entry like professional licensure, if we could get them to be capitalist again, it would be a great thing. And I'm not the first to really speak about this. Look at the, look at the works of Adam Smith and what he did. His whole premise of getting, a market, of getting a market economy and talking about the specialization of labor was just to make the poor prosperous. He was trying in his best way to how do you make a nation richer? It is not by, you know, we all know his famous quote, it is not by the sweat of the brow or the benevolence of the baker and whatever to make their dinner, but because of the money they can make through the thing. It's the market forces that bring people to work. And yet, you know, Charlie, you might think that uh, we are all owed a living. We're not owed a living. We have to go out and work for it. We find a job, we practice that job, and we move forward on that job. It is not by the benevolence of the baker that we have our dinner, but by his, by buying his bread and his wares. And I'll tell you something, if, it, if it, when it comes to capitalism, we have to do something to improve the lives of somebody, or we're not gonna get paid. We have to either improve our bottom line on our employer, we have to, when we oh. come to a restaurant, we, we, help, we help improve our, uh, we, have, we buy the place that gives us a good deal for our food. And, you know, we have to help people to basically prosper and succeed. There. 
There it is. That's in the ring. You're Capitalism. You're brainwashed. Charlie, I'm not brainwashed. I just happen to know better than you what works. Period. All right, sit down. <laughs> Do, do I, hey, hey, uh, Chuck. You want to go in here? Go ahead, Chuck. No, do I have time to? Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, come on. We got Frank. a little time, Frank. Yeah, we were able to see you. Let's hear yeah, you. Andy is up there now. Yeah. Hey, here's Mel, Mel. Andy, Andy's oh. going to. You, you know we got it. We got it. Yeah, Frank wants to go. Frank. All right, Frank. 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 <laughs> Good. He wants to prove the bottom line. Good. <laughs> That's why he hires you, Charlie. He's the bottom line of his lawyer. That's why he hires you. Yeah, yeah I came in, the, in this country in 1963, couldn't speak a word of English. And uh, I started working in a company that treated me real well. I, I, I could make a lot of friends and so on. But uh, I, I thought I could start my own business, so I, I uh, moved to the city of Chicago and I opened uh, what it was called Argento Manufacturing Company. And there I started doing uh, work for other companies. I, I went and solicited uh, work from, from bigger companies. And uh, eventually, I was able to get a contract from a company that did the uh, work for the, for the military. And they were doing millions of pieces that they need to do secondary operations on them. So I designed a machine to do this uh, secondary operation automatically. And um, I bought it per thousand pieces. So I said, if I put this little hole in a thousand pieces, I charge you twelve dollars a thousand. And they thought it was a good deal. So I started making the parts, but instead of making one thousand pieces an hour, I was making twelve. And then twenty-four thousand pieces an hour. So the, the money that I was receiving was outrageous. It was really big money. And uh, I, I never complained about that, and uh, neither the company that I did the work for, they were very satisfied. So they came by themselves and they doubled what I was receiving for 1,000 pieces. They increased my income by double. Um, so I have workers that came and knocked in the door and they asked for a job, and what do you know how to do? Nothing, okay, come on in, and, and they start working. I have very good memories of many, many of the workers, or some of the workers that I have, um, that they came with no, no pretensions of knowing anything, but they were willing to work and learn and, and do what it was necessary and required. So anyway, I, I, I thought I have something to tell you, but I forgot what it was. My mind is not working anymore. So if you start getting old, uh, hurry up and do what you need to do before you get too old. <laughs> yeah. uh, because I was in business, I have the opportunity, a great opportunity to travel. I've been in all parts of the world, Australia. I, I was in the Great Barrier Reef. I, was, I saw life in the mountains of Machu Picchu. I saw life in the depths of the seas in, in Australia. So I, I, I have a wonderful, wonderful life in this country that I don't think I could have anywhere else. Thank you all. Okay, uh, I'd like to say a few words. Uh, I have a quest question for our speaker. Have you given this presentation anywhere else in this form? No. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> What uh, a couple people have expressed, uh, I would express it in a little different way. Your presentation tonight will be much more comprehensible watching it on video mm -hmm. if you have the remote in your hand and you can pause it after every uh, second sentence. Way, uh, the way it was presented is total information overload, where we did not have time to think about what you were talking about. You went on to the next. There was there was three times as much information crammed into that 40 minutes as should be for an understanding presentation. So you know, if you do that in the future and stop and explain a few things, 
you'll get a much better you know connection with the audience. Okay. Um, for those of you that missed it, uh, it wasn't on mainstream news. Uh, the King of Norway uh, posted a picture of The Hague, the international uh, criminal court that tries international war criminals, and he, he posted the caption, uh, Mr. Trump, there is a seat waiting for you here as, <laughs> as soon as the arrest warrant is sworn out. <laughs> Donald Trump is now considered one of the finest international war criminals on the planet. Yeah. And uh, to, to keep addressing him as Mr. President, is a gross distortion of the human language, the English language. He's a corporate criminal, has no no qualifications whatsoever to be sitting in that seat disgracing the Oval Office. And as long as we put up with it, what is the kindest, what does it say about us that the kindest, gentlest thing we can say about the man masquerading as our president is, what an idiot. And that's um, that's a mild adjective compared to what everybody else is saying. But uh, I found an old dictionary cleaning out uh, some old boxes, and I found a dictionary going back about 50 years. I'll make a copy of it because it's got the best definition of the word prostitution in there that I've ever seen. You know, one of them, one one definition is selling sex. The other one is selling your soul for money to produce. Uh, you know, what they call base or uh, detrimental things, selling out your, what our Republican Congress critters are doing. You know, we have the best, I've said it before, we have the finest, best finance, smoothest functioning intellectual whorehouse on the planet yeah. in the Senate and Congress. And if you are not an intellectual prostitute, you can't get elected as a Republican in this country because the billionaires, they tell you what crimes against humanity bills and laws they want passed and if you don't do that they will pour money into your opponent at the next primary. This is why we have 98.9% .9 of the Republican critters openly denying climate change. It's <sighs> talking about capitalism, workers rights, human rights, all of it. Nobody here addressed the concept of billionaire predators with no ethics, no morals, and no conscience running our country. Uh, that gentleman uh, expressed a, said there was an article in the Sun Times, our, uh, the Fed and others are puzzled that the unemployment rate is going down but wages aren't going up. That's because the jobs that are being created are slave labor jobs, poverty wage jobs, because the good paying jobs you know, in factories and everything else have been moved out of this country. People graduate from high school, come out of high school, there's no living wage jobs waiting for them. There's uh, you know, poverty wage jobs. And then the final thing I would say, everybody should realize that Walmart as a corporation is an absolute cancer on America. As Walmart gets bigger, our living conditions, the social conditions and everything else deteriorate as they get a greater and greater share of the labor force working for one third of what the minimum wage should be. One th 22, $22 an hour would be minimum wage compared to 1968. And you could live on that back then. So Charlie, you gonna wrap up? I think Dave wants to speak. Oh, okay. Thank you, let's take him here. Okay, I just want to say something about what Andy said, that it really calls me to have to refer to Trump as Mr. President. Mr. President in those days meant people like, you've heard me say this before, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, people of real stature and ability who knew how to lead. And instead, this is the best we can do in this day and age is Donald Trump. And I used to think that George W. Bush, George Bush the Younger, would go down in history as the world's, as the, uh, as our worst president. Well, then along came Donald Trump. And 
George Bush now looks like a genius and a statesman compared, <laughs> compared, to, compared to Trump. I wouldn't go that far. Hold on, hold the reins on that. Yes, one. I would go that far. And he wasn't a good. And I didn't say that he was a good president. He was not. George Bush orchestrated 9/11. He was you know. just he was just better than Trump. Fair enough. Fair enough. And I was also thinking the other day about Richard Nixon, who was a sick man, who was a crook, who I hated. But even he was a much better president than Donald Trump could ever hope to be. And if we forced him to resign from office, and rightly so, well, it's almost want to see Trump's hand on the block. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andy. You really okay. All right, let's thank Andy and Tim for helping out. All right. And in uh, particular, let's thank our speaker. It was good, good first shot. You're doing it. I know you jumped out the next time you come here. I have an idea what he was trying to do was to blend two antithetical political theories okay. and philosophies and show that they were compatible. Whether you succeeded or not remains. He covered a lot there uh, in a short period of time. I'll be eclectic as usual here. First of all, I heard that socialism is illogical. I good. spent last week in a rural area. It's very common in rural areas to have co-ops. Why do they have co-ops? Because socialistic cooperative activities increase one's chances of success and survival. Farmers realize that, whether it be barn raising or putting up a cabin, uh, collective efforts are possibly the only way success can in fact be achieved. One of the first things, many people don't realize this, the first pieces of automated uh, mechanized equipment in agriculture were purchases made by people who lived next to each other. And that way they shared the equipment and benefited by the automation. But apparently you are unable, and this Ayn Rand was unable to find anything amazingly enough in the history of the United States to show that socialistic activities were in fact a very logical thing to do. Anybody knows that in any collective enterprise, if you work cooperatively, it augments your mathematically your chances of success. That's basic logic. That's called the corporation. And, and the next thing is the Wagner Act. There's there's an absolutely the, at least I'm with a wobbly, but wobbly when the Wagner Act came. It changed the whole the complexion of things. We have only six, you know what I mean? We've got about six labor laws in the history of this whole country, and they can't even, they can't even tolerate one, those six. It bothers them. <laughs> I, I mean, I get lecture on this. I go, there's only six laws, you know. It's really not tough to know labor law. And they hate that one. Why? Because people hold an election and said, I want to, we should bargain collectively and have a contract. And the thing with the Wagner Act, it ends in, the legal right to to be fired with just cause, only for just cause, not arbitrary and capriciously at will. That's the benefit of that law. All the other things are part of it. It means you can't, the boss just can't look at you and say, get out of here, I'm giving your job to my goofy son who's incompetent. Well, can't that, do that's what it's for. The other thing is government, and this is, I first time I heard this, I remember where I heard it, at a restaurant in Belmont with our former libertarian guy. Government is not violent and aggressive. Governments are very good. It's the absence of government where you have aggression and violence. Don't you guys understand that? Don't you poly side guys who sit around and talk about which side it is the absence of government. That's where you end up with warlords or evil people in charge. It's with good government. We have the independent voters of Illinois, and we call it your source for good government. Government saves lives, it protects the innocent. Did you know that? Chicago PD. Well, you, you, just, you, just, you just look at it. Yes, it does. The Chicago police protect people. They you do. got a cop back there, you're goddamn right they do. You're goddamn right, cops do. They put their life on the line for all of us here. They don't give me any jive about that. It's a job I wouldn't do to go in those situations like that. It's dangerous, dirty job, apprehending bad guys and nutcases and whatnot. Cut them off it. Um, the other thing is, um, let's see, oh, what is, oh, uh, yeah, what is, 
Socialism is illogical. Every man for himself is more logical. Uh, anyway, let's see. And uh, Henry George, I'm sorry, Henry George is a little dated. That land thing was okay around the third of the century. And I'm going to improve the bottom line of my employer. Yeah. That's my life. My, my, my purpose with raison d'etre is to make some guy rich. You're hired. You've got to be kidding me, you're man. You're hired because Maybe that was your purpose, but it isn't what job. I do. Thank you very much. That was good. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, you gotta go out there. You gonna, you gonna take that bed? Okay, there? okay. I'm, I'm not gonna shoot on our my teenagers. I'm not gonna lock up my kids for neighbor, dealing weed. My loony neighbor is drunk with guns. <laughs> you Has your loony neighbor ever used pointed a gun at you? Um, All right. For, to David from the Libertarian Party. Come on, to him. <laughs> Cops have pointed guns. Are you gonna come here? Probably I'll, has I'll it. take care of it. Um, to David. Uh, I'm sorry that you feel you have to, you know, compromise. I'm, I'm not really asking you to exactly compromise with the socialist system. I'm just asking you to understand that I hope I didn't appear to, you know, endorse any the force against you. I am really against that. But I want to tell you and Charles that, yeah, cooperatives, nonprofits, egalitarian labor management firms, they all exist. Uh, only, that's only 1% of firms in the economy in America, though. I think there should be more of that. Uh, Charles, I support co-ops. Um, David, I'm, I, I there's no reason that co-ops can't be reconciled with individuals who can buy from them or not buy from them as long as they're not being taxed to pay for their privileges. I agree we should persuade people with logic. Uh, Hannah Arendt, the socialist, said the use of violence is pretty political, uh, meaning that politics is designed to avoid violence. Charles, you're right, politics is designed to avoid violence, but it doesn't really do that most of the time. Um, David, I don't want to recruit from the right anymore. I think we should start recruiting from the left, build an outreach strategy towards Democrats and Greens so they can see that we're not just recruiting from people that they basically consider Nazis. Um, and I don't know how to enforce freedom. I think that's what we're already trying to do, and I think it's not working. But I agree with you that production is because of free well, I want to point out, production is because of free markets and voluntary exchange. I'm not going to appear not to support capitalism. If you want to call what I just said capitalism, that's fine. But I don't support proto capitalism, that's all I'm trying to say. To the third gentleman who spoke, um, I apologize that I inundate everyone with facts and don't have any charisma, but you know, I can't help that. But I don't want to also rely on charismatic authority because the personality call is what Trump and the fascists do. So I hope my passion comes through through my dedicated research instead of any you know, the personality I don't have. And I agree, people should vote. Um, to Raj, uh, I don't oppose capitalist punishment because what if they didn't do it? People have been you know executed who didn't do it in DNA. Evidence exonerates them after 20 oh, years. That's why I don't believe in capital punishment, no matter how horrendous the crime, because still, what if they didn't do it? What if they're set up? Um, Adam, I agree, uh, we should use force only as the last resort. Last, last resort. Um, to the other person named David spoke, I think that wages aren't going up um, because low employment numbers are being lied about. We allegedly have 3.8%, 3 and this also addresses what Andy said. Um, under Obama, I realized that unemployment is really four times what they say it is because of structural unemployment, seasonal unemployment, and non-employment, people who are unemployed but never declare unemployment because they don't want to go on food stamps or whatever uh, assistance. So really, if you multiply it by four, we have 15.2% unemployment. It's still better than what we had under Obama. Um, you know, if you multiply his numbers by four. But I think they've just found a new way to push the number. That's what I think's going on. I agree unions should be higher than the seven to 10% uh, union rate, union membership rate that it's at right now. I agree that should go up. That's why I'm a member of the IWW. I think wage stagnation is also resulting from the fact that contract, plenty of union contracts were signed 20, 30 years ago based on 1990 money and 1990 expectations. And I think that stagnates wages and limits the ability of uh, you know, races to happen and people to earn more money. Uh, also, I, David, I sadly disagree with you, unfortunately, that yellow dog contracts shouldn't be prohibited. Or I, I think they should be allowed. People should what? be allowed to be fired for, not, uh, for, for, for declining to agree not to join a union. But I also believe that people have every right to join a union and be represented by a union who wants to represent their interests, not put other unions in that workplace out of business so they can't negotiate for something more radical or something less radical. I want every person in the workplace to be represented through members only collective bargaining. I agree, Walmart is sucking uh, resources and labor. We need to turn to things like Winco and Costco, but moreover to 
um, and this relates to something you said, Tim, cooperative corporations and the cooperative, cooperative purchasing society. Mm -hmm. People like David Ricardo explained. You pool, you leverage commercial per, consumer purchasing power by pulling people into cooperatives, and that, that leads prices to go down. Um, to Tim, I want to tell you, you're right. G.K. Chesterton, a distributist, said the problem of capitalism is not too few capitalism, not too few capitalists, but too many, excuse me, we need more capitalists, not less capitalists. People need to, more people need to have productive and entrepreneurial capacity. And it's something that Marx, Proudhon, Kevin Carson, and Jeremy Rifkin all agreed on. Decentralization and productive capacity. Uh, people have their own homes, we can, you know, and we solve the land issue. We kick the feds out of most of the land so prices go down. We can solve all those things. Um, and you're right about Smith. He did kind of advocate progressive taxation almost in a way. I think we wouldn't have so much corporate power if we just didn't give him so much power, money, and privilege, ability to enforce our elections in the first place. Um, I'm going to tell Tim and Charles why they're both wrong. Yeah. If Tim's criticism of Charles is correct, that we don't, we aren't owed a living by the government. You're right, Tim. But we also don't have to work for it either because right. bees, you know, pollinate. Tr Pollinate flowers and rain falls from the sky. There's enough food being produced to feed 10 billion people, and there's only seven and a half billion. There's six homes per homeless person. There's enough to go around, and basically, we don't even need a trade exchange or a market economy if you really think about it. Uh, that's another lecture. Um, <laughs> Andy, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so there's a problem with uh, you know you could credit a president for reducing troops, but they could do it by replacing them with mercenaries, dropping bombs, having automatic air defense. There's plenty of ways to continue a war without uh, using a lot of troops. Uh, to Dave, Trump and FDR are both awful. FDR put people in internment camps, uh, you know, scammed them on the price of their gold, and stole a quarter of their working lives by vetoing a 30-hour work week. FDR should not be a good example. What he did was the banks caused moral hazard and regulatory capture, caused people to trust the banks when there were still problems with them. And I think not only does Trump make Nixon good look good, Clinton makes Nixon good. Hillary Clinton makes Nixon look good. Remember, she was in, she was the one who was unethically doing behavior and in, in the uh, attempts to impeach uh, Nixon. I think she makes him look good. He was the guy who founded the EPA. You know, you know, we could probably do without it. I think Democrats should look to Nixon as one of the most progressive, conservative presidents we ever had. Uh, Charles, I didn't say socialism is illogical. I said it's fine as long as it's voluntary. I support the laws once again. Um, and I agree that. Uh, who says it's illogical? David. David, okay. Oh, well, yeah, I don't think socialism is that illogical unless it's, you know, involuntary. I think we can have um, employee. Uh, uh, employee stock ownership programs is a, is a way to transition to more cooperatives. Also, Charles, can I steal your money as long as I use it to protect people? And lastly, politicians yeah. politicians don't apprehend nutcases. Politicians are nutcases because they're all Machiavellians, which is not only a political philosophy, but a mental disorder. All right, before you go, <laughs> my tradition is John Are you in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. they were in. Thank Instead you. of this, we got this. Bill Weld in 2020, it's possible. Yeah. Well, George Will wrote a piece about Bill Weld, uh, uh -huh. how libertarians should nominate him in 2020. We'll have to take a look at it. Gentlemen, I'm in, and we are adjourned. Did you get my point? Okay. 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 David, hope your health is good. Take a breath. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Try to put too much into it. But if you really do it fast, why not on the 4th of July itself? I'm not sure how that plans for that. It's a great question. We have a lot of good information, though. It's on a Thursday. Um, I'll do whatever it was. 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 I'll do
Okay. Let me give you my phone. Go right ahead. Okay. You want me to write it down? Yeah, I still, I still, uh, just write it on the schedule. Yeah.